take a little time, but I'm gonna win. Right, man, what an honor and uh, what an incredible evening so far. Uh, I want to thank all of the musicians, the speakers. I know that uh, it's probably not something that we uh, do enough, but maybe you could just join me in thanking the leadership of your church uh, to enable this event to take place. So thank you, pastors, leaders, all the directors, and all the volunteers. Um, I, I'd like to just spend uh, just a, maybe a few minutes because it's very likely that many of you probably have no idea uh, who I am. Uh, you've seen my face on the website, you know that I'm one of the speakers, but uh, because I'm a fellow brother in Christ, a co-laborer in Christ, I wanted to share a little bit about my story and I'll share a bit about where I come from, my family, what I do, and then we'll read scripture and dive into God's word. Uh, I was born in Seoul, South Korea, and immigrated when I was six years old. I'm turning 54 uh, this year. Praise God for Asian genes. Um, uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's this saying like, black don't crack, Asians don't raisin, and there's nothing that rhymes with white. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, but I was born in Korea, immigrated when I was six years old to San Francisco, and I've been a local church pastor for about 30 years. And about four years ago, I transitioned into a new role serving as the president of an organization called Bread for the World, and I'll share more about this. But one of the things that I always feel so compelled to share, because it's just amazing, God's kindness and grace. My great-grandfather was one of the first people in his village outside of a city called Pyongyang to say yes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. My father was born in what is now called North Korea. Uh, when he was born, there was only one country, one peninsula. But many, many years ago, uh, these missionaries, these believers of Jesus were so compelled, moved, captivated by the gospel that they would get into boats that would take numerous weeks to set sail across the world and they would come and they would share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. They came with the Bible, they would translate the Bible. These missionaries alongside local Korean indigenous leaders, they helped build the first schools, the first orphanages, the first universities, the first hospitals. It's pretty amazing. And so my great-grandfather heard the gospel of Jesus, was so moved that he goes home, shares the good news with my great-grandmother. She says yes to Jesus, and faith begins to trickle down our entire family line. Amen. Now, I was 18 years old when I made, a, I guess, a personal confession and decision to follow Christ. But as I look back, I, I, I just have always sensed God's hand of grace reaching after me. And I say this to you because I want you to know that no one is an island to themselves. And I know sometimes like as men, we feel like we've gotta put some posturing, if you will. But I want you to realize, even you, myself, all of us, no one is an island to themselves. Someone prayed for you, someone encouraged you, someone nourished you, someone exhorted you, someone mentored you, someone elevated you, someone, whatever that description might be, Someone invested in you. And the most important thing as you walk away, as you receive God's goodness, mercy, and grace tonight, is to make sure that that goodness, mercy, and grace, it doesn't stop with you. That you've got to pour into your children, our family, our neighbors, those around us, our coworkers. And so every time I have this opportunity by God's grace to speak and share about the gospel, I mean, think about this. I wonder if my great-grandfather could have envisioned many, many, many decades later by his obedience to say yes to the gospel of Jesus, his great-great-grandson or great-grandson would be speaking in 
Texas to 1,200 men with a live bull outside the church. It's, God is amazing. So I immigrated to San Francisco and uh, I just flew in from Korea actually, literally 36 hours ago. And I flew in to Seattle and came back here to Texas to spend some time with you. And I was there because my wife and I just celebrated our 27th anniversary last week. Um, we're so grateful. And uh, just so that you have an idea kind of where I'm coming from, I wanna share a photo of my wife and I when we first met. Now, this is us. Uh, they used to call me the Asian John the Baptist uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, the photos on the bottom are our wedding photos, traditional Western wedding and a traditional Korean wedding. And my wife uh, is now a marriage and family therapist. Pause for dramatic effect. Uh, it means she wins every argument in our family. And fast forward 27 years, this is our family photo from last Christmas. Uh, these are our three children. I have a 25-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 20 year old. Now, I do wanna introduce my children's names to you. Because if you understand our children's names, you'll have a good idea how it is that we wanna live our lives. Our children have both biblical names, but with also pop culture references. And truly, our conviction is we pray that our children, rooted in God's word, knowing that their identity comes from Jesus, takes to heart the call to be light and salt to the world. Uh, so for example, our eldest, her name is Jubilee. Jubilee from uh, the Bible in Leviticus, where every 50 years, God forgives debts, calls people to ease on the land, and the list goes on, and Jubilee is an X-Men character. Okay, wrong crowd. Okay, so uh, our second child, her name is Trinity. Uh, obviously, we know what it means from a biblical context and uh, from the film Matrix. Okay, again, wrong crowd. Uh, and then lastly, uh, my son, I, I have to confess, his name is my favorite. His name is Jedi. Jedi. Now, I don't know if you know this, but if you read George Lucas's biography, you'll know that he was deeply influenced by Judeo-Christian kind of worldview and background. And they believe that Jedi comes from the Old Testament name from Solomon, Jedediah, which means the chosen one or the chosen beloved. Now, whenever I share, especially at a men's conference, that my son is named Jedi. Inevitably, a group of like young men rush the stage afterwards and they basically say, uh, Pastor Eugene, how did you convince your wife to name your son Jedi? <laughs> Teach us, O <oh> Yoda. <laughs> now, this is wisdom that I'm gonna try to share with you here. When I told my wife that I wanted to name our son Jedi, she was not happy with that idea. I said, honey, I've always been a deep Star Wars fan. It's also biblical. Can we name our son Jedi? And she said, no. Now, I don't know if the cameras can zoom in front of my face here, but being a true Star Wars fan, I looked at her and I said, we will name our son Jedi. <laughs> now, it, it did not work. Uh, and we thought about this for numerous months. And eventually, it just hit me that I went to my wife and I said, Minhi, I am so sorry. You, the mother of this child, you're the one carrying this life, our son, in your womb. You should choose our son's name. Man, she was so happy. So I then said, here's your choice. <laughs> it's Jedi or Frodo. One of these two <laughs> you choose. Now, I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that she chose J 
Jedi because Frodo Cho does not sound right to me. <laughs> now, just 90 seconds on uh, the organization that I'm um, leading right now, and there's a slide here. If you get a chance sometime this week, I would love to encourage you uh, to lift a prayer for us and to check out bread.org. Bread for the World is a Christian advocacy organization urging our lawmakers to do all that they can to help end hunger in the U.S. and around the world. After being a local church pastor for about 30 years, God called me into this ministry and leadership. It's one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. I spend the majority of my time with Congress with the White House, with different agencies in our government, urging them to do more, to humanize our neighbors. And one of the things that I often tell them is that in the wealthiest nation in the world last year, to have 17 million children in the United States experience food insecurity is shocking and stunning. And around the world right now, you might not know this because there's so much happening in our world, but we are facing the worst hunger crisis in about 50 years right now. And to give you just a snapshot, 45 million children experience right now as I'm speaking something called wasting, where they're so malnourished, so hungry, that their bodies are withering away. And what's even more frustrating is that we have remedies. We know what to do if we have the will. So I'm really grateful for hope, fellowship, for all that it does for its parishioners, its community, its neighbors. And I wanna encourage you to learn more about Bread for the World. Check us out at bread.org. And all we're asking for is people to join their voices with us as we encourage our lawmakers to do more. Friends, if you have your Bibles with you, I wanna ask you to just turn, if you have your Bibles, to John 21, verses one to 14. Listen for God's word. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off, jumped into the water, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 but even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. In a short bit, I'm gonna try to exegete, kind of parse out this passage to give you some better understanding of what's going on. But I wanna just be a little vulnerable and share with you that in the last 36 hours, I changed the sermon that I was gonna teach here three times. 
And even earlier today, just worshiping, being in the space, feeling a sense from the Holy Spirit to kind of make some adjustments. Because I wanna make sure that I'm not just giving some sort of a, a product, a package, but trying to be sensitive as you are to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And I know that the theme of this Foundry Conference is that this is not our first rodeo. And I understand the, the premise behind it, that it's not calling us, encouraging us to be arrogant, but to have a sense of confidence. And I say a wholehearted amen. So even as I echo and amplify and cheer on that theme, I also sense the Holy Spirit just earlier tonight during worship asking me, and I say this humbly, to also encourage someone here to make sure this is not your last rodeo. To not quit, to persevere, to press on. And I say this because again, as a man, as a father, as a husband, as a lead pastor for many, many years, and even amplified in our Asian culture where in my culture, men could not, should not, ought not exhibit any sort of emotional weakness, frailty, vulnerability. This is saddening, but there's a reason right now, South Korea has the highest suicide rate in the world, by far. Because there's still this perception, particularly for men, that we have to have a particular position and posture in our manhood. And so as a result, even in this country now, we're beginning to see men with higher epidemics of suicide, of mental health issues, so much that there are cities in this country for the first time ever now calling and labeling mental health and loneliness a health epidemic in their region. And I think one of the most tragic things, especially in the church, is if men gather together and somehow, because of some sort of a stigma that we can't be vulnerable, we begin to linger and fester in isolation. So I pray that the Holy Spirit reminds us that we can be confident in the Lord, that it's not our first rodeo, but I also want to encourage anyone today who is at their last string to make sure in the name of Jesus, this is not your last rodeo. God has more for you. God has more for you. Now, this is the reason why I wanna share with you a little bit about John 21, but as I do this, and this is gonna be kind of a convoluted sermon, and I'm just trying to be obedient to a few things that I'm feeling from the Holy Spirit. You need to know and I'm not here trying to uh, exert some sort of a, a theological juggernaut here. I don't always know all the theological positions that churches may have or that you may have, but I want you to know that in this life, you have to understand there are two truths for you, us to be mindful and wise about. The first one obviously is that there is only one God, one true God, and his name is our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But I want you to realize that there's another wisdom that is incredibly helpful for us, and it is the wisdom that there is also a devil. Now again, maybe you weren't expecting to hear a talk about the devil, and I'm not gonna go into a long, long teaching about the devil, but I wanna share with you, I believe this is the key between confidence and arrogance. Confidence is knowing that there is not just a God, but one God, and there is no comparison, but we also live as men who are wise. 
And what do I mean by wise? Listen to the words of a theologian, pastor, author by the name of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, he is giving a talk at Magdalen College at Oxford on July 5th, 1941. And in this talk, I'll never forget the content of this particular speech that he gives. C.S. Lewis warns of what he called the two equal and opposite errors into which our human race can fall about the devils. So let me translate that. He says there are basically two big mistakes that we can have about our understanding of the devils. You understanding this is going to give you all the insight between the distinction, nuance between confidence and arrogance. So this is what C.S. Lewis says. He's trying to answer the question, what is the opposite of God? Or who is the opposite of God? I'm not sure if you've ever contemplated that question in some of my philosophy classes, we would have discussions and debates about what is or who is the opposite of God. And this is what C.S. Lewis says, quote, there is no uncreated being except God. God has no opposite. The proper question is whether I believe in devils, I do. That is to say, I believe in angels and I believe that some of these, by the abuse of their free will, have become enemies to God. Satan, the leader or dictator of devils, is the opposite, not of God, but of Michael. One error is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive perception. So let me break it down again. Here are the two big mistakes, and then we'll continue. Some of you might make the mistake of thinking there is no devil. And we will be lacking in wisdom because the devil is real, and the devil also seeks to exploit and bring death and destruction to God's creation. Let me come back to this. The other mistake is not that we believe in a devil, but we cower in fear of the devil. We give it too much clout, too much authority, too much power. We think the devil is the opposite of God when it shudders at the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have to understand the wisdom behind these two things. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to live as men who cower in fear of the evil one, of Satan, of Beelzebub, or whatever you want to call it. But I suspect that there are some of us who make this mistake. That either we don't believe that the devil exists, or that we don't believe that the devil is at work right now. Let me give you an example. We're at a men's conference, and so I'm just going to assume that many of us probably enjoy competition. We enjoy sports. I love sports. In my family, our two mottos is Jesus is Lord and ball is life, are the two mottos in our family. I love all things sports, I love basketball which is the reason why even at the age of 53, two ruptured Achilles, two blown knees, I can't stop playing basketball. I still love playing basketball. And when you get on the basketball court, one of the things that you do when you're warming up is you're basically sizing up your competition. You want to know, does this person go left? Does this person go right? Does this person dribble one-handed? Does this person, is he a shooter? Is this person a driver? Is this person a mid-range person? What kind of player is this person? And if you're competitive, what are you going to do? You begin to exploit 
the weakness of your, of your opponent. So let me give you another example. If Pastor John and I are playing ping pong, as brothers in Christ, we're just having a nice little game and talking smack about cowboys and Seahawks. It's all really friendly until someone says, let's play a game. Then at that point, something changes in the atmosphere because we're all competitive. And during our rallying, I have done an analysis if he prefers his forehand or his backhand, usually the everyday American has a weakness on one or the other. And even though we're brothers in Christ, this is what I'm gonna do. I am going to hit as many balls as possible to his weakness. Why? Because I wanna win. I want you to know there is a devil. The devil is alive. The devil cowers in fear and in the authority of Jesus, but it still has an ability to bring death and destruction here on this earth. And we've gotta be wise. This is the reason why when we're talking about uh, that this isn't our first rodeo, there's a difference between confidence and arrogance. In our scripture passage today, I believe there are several lessons to help us to be equipped in a sense to put on the armor of God in addition to what we learn from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Now, I want you to know why this passage has so much meaning to me in my life. The reason why this story, this passage is so meaningful, there's a couple of reasons. One is I love all things outdoors. I'm a wannabe outdoorsman. I'm a wannabe hunter. I'm a wannabe hiker. And I also love fishing. Just out of curiosity here, how many of you guys here enjoy fishing? Raise your hand if you enjoy fishing. Uh, not as many as I thought in Texas, but that's good. How many of you guys enjoy eating fish? Raise your hand. Wow, a lot of lazy people here, that's interesting. Uh, so I'm a big fisherman, uh, so I thought I would uh, share a photo from a recent catch. Uh, this is a recent largemouth, and some of you are wondering what's the point of sh showing this photo in this sermon. There is no point. Uh, this is what fishermen do. We always carry around our photos. Now, genuinely, it's one of the reasons why I love this passage. Everything related to the outdoors and fishing, my imagination grows rampant. But the second reason why I love this passage is that it's not just a fishing story. It's not just a breakfast story. This story, when you dig into it, when you peel the layers of the story, this story is a story of vulnerability of exhaustion, it's a story of someone or a group of people who walked with Jesus and they're just so exhausted, they wanna give up. Now, let me unpack this. Pastors and scholars believe that when Peter says, I'm going fishing, he's not just saying I'm going fishing, that what he's in essence saying is, I'm wanting to go back to what I was doing before Jesus called me. And when you understand this passage in that context, it's pretty stunning that you've got a group of disciples, there's seven of them in this passage. They walk with Jesus, slept with Jesus, hung out with Jesus, ate with Jesus, did ministry with Jesus. They saw the miracles of Jesus. They even saw the resurrection of Jesus and yet, they come to a time in their lives when they say, I'm going fishing. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I hate the uncertainty of life. I'm weary. I'm heavy laden. This is too complicated. This is too messy. Or how about this phrase that maybe you have thought or said or blurted out while you were driving down a highway, quote, this isn't what I signed up for. I don't know about you, but just full confession, 
those words have been uttered from my mouth numerous times. This isn't what I signed up for. And you see, this isn't the first time that followers of God were tempted to go back. The story of the Israelites in the exile in the desert, even though God frees them from the bondage of Pharaoh and slavery, it's stunning to me that even after liberation in the desert, some of them began to say what? I wanna go back to Egypt. I wanna go back to what I was doing before I experienced the power of God. Isn't that stunning and amazing? And we have these disciples here again, who've already witnessed the resurrection. This is the third time in which Jesus appears to the disciples and they want to give up. So here's what we can learn. This is how we can equip ourselves during these challenging times. I know that it's probably not likely that you're taking notes and minutes with nice flowery uh, uh, illustrations on whatever mental pad that you have, but I wanna encourage you to remember these things. Here's number one. Here's the first thing that you've got to remember. The first thing when you feel like the devil is after you, here's the first one. It's the most important one. If there's something that you should remember, it's this first point. Here it is, number one, always remember, Jesus is alive. Amen. Jesus is alive. And friends, what I mean by this is that as you're reading John 21, as you're going through this, uh, there's so much details of the story that we forget that this man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was crucified and three days later, just as he said, the power of God raised him from the dead. So as to say, he's not just some sort of a revolutionary figure, he's not just a moral teacher, that this man, Jesus Christ, is who he says he is. He is the son of God, the alpha and the omega, the morning star. He is not just a rabbi and a teacher. He is our savior who was sent so that you and I would never perish in damnation. But if we say yes to Christ, reconcile to God, Jesus Christ is Lord and savior and he is worthy to be worshiped. It's the most important thing. And I'm not suggesting that just by saying this or believing this, that everything in your life is gonna be perfect or rosy. But when you understand that one day, Jesus is going to return to restore all things back onto himself, man, it gives you a particular perspective. This is not my first rodeo. And by God's grace, this will not be my last. Jesus is alive. Here's the second thing that we can learn from this passage. The second thing is that you've gotta understand why the disciples are troubled. And how I articulate this is clarity versus presence. See, why is it that these disciples are troubled and are at this moment of wanting to quit. I think it's because they struggle even back then with something called the human obsession for control. Is that you? Because that's me. Like I want control of my life. I wanna know exactly what my future will look like and I want you to realize, I can just imagine the disciples having this incredible moment. The first two times they saw the risen Christ, Jesus comes, he conquers death. He tells them, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I can just imagine the disciples having one of those rah-rah end zone moments or jumping up and down. And then Jesus disappears. And I just wonder if the disciples, after that mountaintop moment, they look at each other and go, okay, uh, how do we do this? 
Have you ever had a moment where you felt God spoke to you? God gave you a conviction, he gave you a tug in some way and you were so pumped up. And then a few months later, you're like, wait, was that real? Or we become exhausted or we face opposition. It's not as easy as we thought or we just don't know what we're supposed to do. And after a while, we just say, I, I, I wanna quit. Do you find it interesting that oftentimes Christians, we love to use the name of Jesus to enter into situations, but when we exit, we just slowly exit without any mention of Jesus. I want you to realize that there is a difference between clarity and presence. In other words, as followers of Jesus, I don't believe the scriptures ever say that God will give you absolute clarity and certainty of all things in your life. The gospel is not certainty. The gospel is that Jesus saves us by God's grace when we place our faith in Jesus and the gospel is the promise of his presence in our lives. In other words, friends, you're not alone. No matter what you're going through, whether you're on your mountaintop, in the valleys, or everything in between, you are not alone. I love the truth of scriptures, Matthew 28, verse 20b. He promises that he will be with us always. Romans chapter eight, verse 39b, nothing will separate us from the love of God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse five, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Right now, let these words soak in. The God of the universe, the God of the cosmos, he loves you, he sees you, he knows you, and God is still pursuing after you. Praise be to God. Here's the third thing that we can learn from our passage here, is that as men, as brothers, this applies to the entire church. But I wanna tell you right now, one of the most important spiritual disciplines that you and I have to develop by God's grace is that we've got to learn to listen to God's voice. We are living in the busiest and the noisiest time in the history of the world. And you know this, whether it's television, our tablets, our technology, the phones, whether it's the largest massive billboards ever in the world, it's in Texas. When I drove from the airport today, I could not believe the size of the billboards that you have. It is crazy. So we're bombarded by messages, including messages from people that have an agenda that want to somehow get into your soul to somehow alter your sense of identity. And the most important thing that we've got to learn and understand is I am a son of the most high living God, a beloved of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. That Jesus Christ, even before Jesus ever did anything, before any miracles, before the massive crowds when he was baptized, remember the heavens opened up and God spoke this word, you are my beloved. I'm not knocking the achievements that you and I have, our possessions, our jobs, our degrees. I'm not knocking those things to have a place. They have a place in our world and even in our lives. But whenever anything is elevated above our identity as sons of Christ, it becomes idolatrous. So what do I mean by God's voice? If we can learn something from the disciples in the beginning, they had no idea that it was Jesus. They had no idea. Jesus, from the distance from shore says, friends, haven't you any fish? By the way, that is the worst question to ask a fisherman if they've caught nothing. 
But here's my question to you. Do you think Jesus didn't know? You think Jesus, an all-knowing God, actually did not know? You think when Jesus asks questions, you think it's because he genuinely doesn't know? Or is it possible that whenever Jesus asks the question, he's trying to teach us a lesson? But what's the lesson here? I want you to know that Peter, several of the disciples, before they became disciples of Christ, they were not just fishermen who fished for a hobby, this was their business. This was their livelihood. And I want you to know that they fished the Sea of Galilee thousands of times. They knew the best methods, the best spots, the best techniques. They were experts. Let me just give you an example. I love fishing. So as a result, over the years, I've accumulated certain equipments and lures. I love particularly salmon fishing and bass fishing. So I've got, you know, a five, six rod. I've got a six, six rod. I've got a seven foot rod, a seven, six rod. I've got a 10 foot steel, steelhead salmon rod as well. I've got bait casters and spin casters. I've got lots of different lures and techniques. Some of you who fish, you understand there's the Texas rigs, for example. There's the Ned rigs, the Neko rigs, the Tokyo rigs. There's lots of crankbaits that you can use that will dive into the water at different levels. There's top water for certain situations and circumstances. My point to you is I'm a better fisherman than most of you. It's because over the years I've learned, and so I want you to know these disciples, they knew how to fish the Sea of Galilee. And yet, what's the lesson? Friends, haven't you any fish? Here's, here's a sobering lesson. For us as followers of Christ, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We might think we can do it for a season, and we can, but for the marathon of life, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Amen. And so we've got to learn how to listen to God's voice during a time when researchers tell us that the average American over the age of two consumes about five hours and 30 minutes of media every single day. Do you hear what I just said? The average American consumes about five and a half hours of media every single day. If Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, fully God, fully human, chose to regularly, rhythmically retreat for silence, prayer, and time with God the Father, how much more do we need this? Friends, nurture build this gift, this discipline, this habit of listening and hearing the voice of God. I wanna jump to the last one here. I'm gonna just skip a couple things. And here's the last thing that I'll share with you. This, whether it's your first rodeo, your 50th rodeo, no matter where you are, I want you to remember these words. They are, in my opinion, some of the most beautiful words in Scripture. It goes like this. Come and have breakfast. Now, let me explain this. We read the passage. You know what's going on. Jesus knows that they've had another existential angst moment. Jesus knows that Peter again stumbles and falls. As Peter is coming to shore, I want you to imagine if this scripture reading went a different way. Just use your imagination. What if as Peter is coming to shore, Jesus, instead of receiving him with the words, come and have breakfast, what if Jesus gave him the silent treatment?
Or how about the one word responses? Again? Seriously? Bro. For the young people, bruh. <laughs> no, seriously, what if it got more serious, like really serious? Have you ever in your life heard another human being say to you devastating words that demoralized you? Have you yourself said that to someone else? What if Jesus saw Peter and said, I can't use you. You are such a disappointment. You're so unreliable. You're worthless. That word I had for you as the cornerstone, forget about it. It's over. It's your last rodeo. Just for a moment, I, I, I want you to see if you were present in that space, if Jesus said those words to Peter or said those words to you. And here's the greatest antidote to the presence of the devil in our world and in our lives. It's called grace. Grace. I love these words that Tim Keller, the late pastor, this is how he describes the gospel. He says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared when people ask me, Pastor Eugene, help me understand grace, I go to John 21 and I say, imagine this. After all that's happened, this is Jesus to Peter. And he points to the food. Some of the most beautiful words I told you. Jesus says, come and have breakfast. Friends, I want you to know, and maybe this is another conference, Jesus has work for you. He has a mission for you. He has tasks for you. Not because he's calling you to earn his love. He has work for you. He has the mission of God upon you in this church, your campus. But more importantly, he desires to nourish you, feed you, restore you, replenish you. Jesus cares about you. And in a culture, sometimes even in a church culture, where it feels like men have a external seat. We can't show that we're famished or hungry or lonely or exhausted or burdened. Man, you have come to the right place tonight to be reminded, Jesus, come and have breakfast. Hey, would you pray with me? Friends, in a bit, the worship team will come up. If I may, I know that to the majority of you, we have not met prior to this and will likely not meet again, I don't know. But with all the worship, the teaching, the videos, all of these things, I don't wanna miss this opportunity to give anyone an opportunity to respond to the words, come and have breakfast. So I'm not here to manipulate people. I'm just gonna ask you a simple question tonight. You're sitting here, you've never made a decision to respond to this question, come and have breakfast. To believe in Jesus, to confess your sins, and to receive the life transformative power of the love and grace of Jesus Christ.
So friends, I'm just gonna ask you one time, if that's you, I'm not here to embarrass you, eyes are all closed. If that's you, can you just raise your hand so that we can pray with you? To my left, brother, I see your hand. Keep your hand up just for a bit. In the center, I see your hand. In the front, brother, I see your hand. In the front left, I see your hand. Let me just take a moment. In the back, I see your hand, sir. Brothers, just keep your hands up, because I want to make sure at least the pastors and leaders and small group leaders, sir, in the center, I see your hand. Our two brothers here, God, I see your hand. Praise be to God. And so, Father, I want to pray for these brothers who've made this decision tonight only because you're able to save. Only you are able to save. Father, I pray that as they come and confess their sins, they believe in Jesus. We now pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit to pour into their lives as they become born again. God, we celebrate this. And brothers, one last question. If any of you tonight, you're just feeling convicted to recommit your life to Christ. Again, I don't know what your life circumstance is, but you're making a decision tonight to say, I want to recommit my life. If that's you, can you just quietly raise your hand as well so that your leaders can pray for you? Yes, sir, I see your hand in the front. I see numerous hands here in the middle. In the back row, I see your hand. Keep your hands up so that your pastors and leaders can see your hand. Sir, in the white, I see your hand. Praise God. Thank you for your decision to recommit your life. On my far right, I see your hand. Lord Jesus, you see every hand or every prayer that's lifted right now, convicted by the Holy Spirit to say, I want to return to Jesus. Lord, whatever that means, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reassure them with your kindness and your mercy and the power of the Holy Spirit to repent to be able to change more into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for these men tonight who've made life-changing decisions. God, for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brothers, let's celebrate these brothers who made decisions. God bless you.